1990, uh, under the term mapping the brain and its functions, integrating enabling technologies into neuroscience research, uh, with Joe Martin as the chair and uh, co-editor of the report, Constance Kachura. And you can see here that there was a long list of representatives of the public and the academic and private uh, domains. And sure enough, here's <coughs> Vint Cerf representing the new age of the internet. <coughs> uh, I had the privilege of co-chairing a subcommittee of the, um, of the uh, committee uh, with him on uh, the diversity of neurons, uh, which uh, were impressive and to him and uh, made it clear to him and everyone on the committee that neuroscience data are much more complex than sequence data, that uh, genome project informatics is trivial by comparison. One of the important things that the committee dedicated itself to right from the start was that all information needed to be part of this, what was conceived of as this uh, integrated map of the brain. And this represents what Sean has already shown you, uh, the uh, levels from genes and proteins up through cells and circuits to behavior. And I think that was a key for why we are all gathered together here to pursue all that range of disciplines and data that Sean told us about, uh, uh, illustrated. Uh, the, some of the key recommendations of the committee were that there should be a long-term goal of multidisciplinary, multi-level mapping of the brain, that there should be the development of integrated and interrelated databases. I'm just extracting here from the recommendations, specific recommendations. And finally, that in, rather than having one big, giant, monolithic program, that uh, a strategy, strategy should be followed of pilot projects dealing with the diverse data by actual R01 type program uh, projects, uh, projects, individual projects. <clears throat> the, I think it's appropriate to recognize the initial leaders of that human brain project um, that uh, started us off. Uh, Steve Koslow, the founding director, along with the co-director, Michael Herta. We opted for the title Human Brain Project to emphasize the vision that we had that would be comparable to the vision of the Human Genome Project. Uh, but it became clear uh, that I, the real challenge we had was to develop the tools in order to reach that goal of an integrated human brain project. And so the term in neuroinformatics began to emerge. And I thought it was interesting to try to find out when the term actually uh, evolved. The earliest I've been able to find was the establishment of the Institute of Neuroinformatics, quite separate from the Human Brain Project, of course, at, uh, the, at the university in the ETH of Zurich uh, with Rodney Douglas and Kevin Martin in 1995. There was then a uh, volume uh, by Koslow and Herta on, entitled Neuroinformatics in 1997. Uh, we did a review article for Trends uh, in 1998 that used the term. And then there were following volumes uh, that used the term as the, uh, in, uh, as the overall description of these various tools and databases that were beginning to emerge. Uh, we can discuss later uh, others who may have uh, uh, cite, uh, know about citations that are earlier than this. So an important part of the 
recommendations of the original committee was that diverse data should be gathered and integrated in terms of computational, quantitative computational models. Uh, and that uh, then meant that the rise of neuroinformatics would be uh, closely associated with computational neuroscience. Computational neuroscience had its origins, of course, in the Hodgkin and Huxley action potential model in 1952. Uh, uh, that was the 60th anniversary of that publication, those five publications, uh, was held in Cambridge, England just earlier in the year. Uh, at that time, uh, we also uh, were part of that celebration because uh, Wilfred Rohl then introduced compartmental modeling in the 60s, as represented here, the compartmentalization of branching dendritic trees, plus the representation of synaptic potentials. Uh, and so from those two publications, we date the origins of computational neuroscience. I joined Rawl in the 60s, and together we applied uh, a Hodgkin-Huxley-like model of the action potential together with uh, the compartmental analysis uh, approach of Will uh, to olfactory bulb neurons. And Mark has mentioned that uh, this led then to a compartmental model based on electrophysiological recordings that predicted a dendrodendritic synaptic interaction between mitral and granule cells in the olfactory bulb that predicted uh, these uh, actual side-by-side uh, 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 -side, uh, uh, excitatory and inhibitory synapses mediating lateral in inhibition of mitral cells to the granule cells. So as Mark said, this could well be the first rep uh, uh, example of a microcircuit. Um, it includes, of course, everything from the synaptic level to the dendritic level and to the microcircuit level. So it, it represents the sort of goal that, um, that uh, was envisaged, envisaged in the original Human Brain Project uh, meetings of integrating data into computational models. And uh, in the succeeding years, we built that model into the sequence of, of stages of processing that take place in the olfactory system from the initial transduction of the uh, odor information contained in odor molecules in the olfactory epithelium by the olfactory receptors to the representation of that information in activity maps in the glomeruli, the processing of those maps by the mitral granule cell lateral interactions, uh, the construction of a content addressable memory in olfactory cortex and on to orbital frontal cortex uh, within the prefrontal cortex, the highest level of the brain uh, uh, where perception is carried out. So to support that work, we developed uh, a number of digital tools. And uh, in our review in 98, we summarized some of the tools that were needed in general and that we then proposed to develop in, uh, specifically. And that led to the construction of what we call SenseLab, a long-term effort to build integrated multidisciplinary models of neurons and neural systems uh, that includes uh, several databases related to the specifically olfactory problem, although it has a general interest, uh, because the olfactory problem starts with the largest gene family in the genome. Uh, the olfactory receptors, of which there are over a thousand in uh, virtually all mammals. Um, and so we, we um, uh, in the early s efforts to sequence the uh, genes by several laboratories in the 1990s, they came to us and asked, 
if we would construct a database that would support this community effort. And starting with that, uh, we have uh, uh, added uh, to the uh, uh, sequences that have been generated over the years, and there are now over 14,000 receptor sequences uh, in, in the ORDB. And if there's time, I, at the end, I could come back and uh, show you uh, how that database works. Uh, but uh, I, I'll also have a demo where I can also show you that for those who are interested. Uh, we also have a database of the odor molecules that interact with the receptors and an odor map database of the maps that are generated representing the uh, information in the odor molecules. But I thought there would be more interest, general interest, in this group in our neuronal databases that start out with a database uh, that represents an inventory of the receptors and channels and neurotransmitters that are found in given cell types uh, uh, with then a connection to neuron DB, which represents uh, the expression of those properties in different parts of the neuron, then how those are incorporated into models uh, both for uh, channels and neurons, and finally into microcircuits. So it's here that I go on the high wire, and let's go to a browser. And I thought that the essence of databases and digital tools is how they're actually used at the desk or in the lab when you've got a few minutes or a few seconds to look up something. And so it seems to me the key to the tools that we're developing is how accessible and how quickly usable they are. So I'm going to try to show you that. Now, uh, I may only demonstrate that it's not feasible in a lecture hall, but let's give it a try. So our first database is CellPropDB. And this is a resource that is intended to serve as a repository for data on gene products expressed in different brain regions, support research on cellular properties, gateway for inputting data into canonical neuron forms in neuron DB, identify receptors across neuron types to aid in drug development, serve as a first step toward functional genomics, and a teaching aid. So we can go into the um, the database, and we have a number of cell types represented. Our interest, of course, is primarily in the olfactory bulb, but almost as much in comparing the properties in the system we're working on with properties in other neurons in order to carry out a comparative analysis that gives a context for understanding any given system. And I think that comparative context is one of the main themes I'd like to get across uh, today and also in, uh, with uh, the philosophy of sense lab. So here we have the olfactory bulb mitral cell and there's a representation of it morphologically and here's an inventory of pro properties uh, that highlighted are the uh, profile for the mitral cell. Uh, and so you can see the receptors, currents, and transmitters um, are represented here and so let's say that we are interested, uh, and so this gives the profile for the mitral cell. Now let's say that we're interested in uh, comparing the mitral cell with GABA uh, receptors with all other cells that have GABA receptors. So we can go down here, we can click on that, and this immediately brings up then a subset of cells that all have GABA receptors. Uh, uh, on them. And so you can see that this includes both principal neurons, output neurons, and uh, various kinds of inner neurons as well across many parts of the nervous system, uh, some of which one may be uh, aware of, like the hippocampus, others uh, not, such as uh, the uh, ganglion, uh, retinal ganglion uh, cells or cells in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Uh, we can, in addition to a single property, put in a variety of any, any combination of properties that we think might represent some significant kinds of activity. 
And so under currents, we can, we can ask for transient sodium currents and A currents, for example, and go to submit those. And this immediately then gives us a somewhat smaller subset of cells now that are, are expressing that combination of properties. And so this, I, uh, you can see that this could uh, uh, be used for any particular set of, of, of properties that you're interested in. But uh, the, I think the main point here is that we're beginning to move toward a multi-disciplinary, uh, multi-field uh, uh, approach to identifying families across all of a particular uh, set of, uh, of uh, entities in a database. So like in a, gene, in a sequence database, you can look for particular combinations of sequences uh, and identify new classes and families of receptors or channels in the same way we can do that for different types of cells uh, in, in, the, um, in the nervous system. However, uh, it's obvious to most of us who work on cells that it's not just the expression of different properties by a whole cell, but it's where in the cell those properties are expressed because a cell contains a number of compartments, uh, virtual compartments, uh, in which integrative, different types of integrative action occur. And so, for example, for the mitral cells, we have a proximal region, a middle region, and a distal region of the primary dendrite. This is the part of the distal part out in the glomerulus. The same can be said of the lateral dendrites, the soma, action, uh, axon, hillock, axon, and, and uh, terminals complete the sort of basic compartmental structure of a neuron. We call this a canonical representation of the neuron. Um, it enables us to identify the major integrative sites in a cell, but it also means that if we do this for all cells, we can search across different compartments of different cells and be much more specific about this new classification way of classifying cells. Uh, so we then go to our next database. We're right there in neuron DB. And so here's that same cell, and now here's the canonical representation of it in a compartmental way. And now we can bring up the data. And now instead of being for the entire cell, this is just for the distal apical dendrite. And now we can ask, uh, and so uh, first of all, we see that this is the integrative structure for this compartment. And it's more than just a, a GABA receptor or glutamate receptor. It's also the intrinsic currents. And in this case, uh, it's also the fact that this compartment can release glutamate. It's presynaptic as well. But let's now ask our same question. Um, how about all distal apical dendritic, uh, distal compartments uh, of dendrites that uh, express GABA, GABA receptors. And here we have now a subset. So you see it's, it's a smaller subset than we saw with the whole cell uh, representation. Now at a compartment, at a distal uh, dendritic compartment level, uh, it's a smaller subset. And again, it, cr it uh, crosses uh, both principal neurons and uh, interneurons. So now we can ask the same question that we did before of adding in other kinds of intrinsic currents. So let's ask now about our transient sodium current and our A current. And now you see these have a completely different significance um, because the transient sodium channel is, of course, present in many neuro most neurons that are generating action potentials in their axons. But now we've got a distal AP a distal apical dendritic compartment that we're also asking, does it have the ability to generate action potentials? And are there also A currents, which usually are present in order to balance out that excitability? And so now if we search, we see that there, that there are, that there are, in addition to the mitral cell, 
Uh, there are the CA1 pyramidal neuron, the dendrate granule cell, cerebellar Purkinje cell, and the, the neocortical pyramidal neuron uh, also have that, this particular combination of properties. And now it gets, it's getting interesting because that means that uh, active properties can be involved in the integrative action the activity that's taking place in that distal compartment. Now, at this point, uh, you might be you might be interested in, in um, the fact that the CA1 pyramidal neuron is also part of this subset. So let's just go and see what it looks like. And immediately, we're in. Uh, the uh, CA1 hippocampal pyramidal neuron, and you can see it has its own uh, set of, uh, uh, of uh, properties. And we could fill in all of these and look, uh, or many of them, and look for different combinations uh, across uh, uh, this, uh, this or other types of neurons. So that indicates the kind of of exploration one can make of the integrative structure of every nerve cell in the database and in a, within a comparative context of relating it to any of the other neurons in, in the database and bringing out new classes of neurons that have particular uh, combinations of properties. In addition, uh, we build con connectivity into this so that we specify the connections that are responsible for uh, the inputs to the receptors uh, and for the connections made from the output from the axons or from the dendrites in, 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 the, in, this, in this particular case. And so we are building in then what can become the basis for the connectome, a micro connectome of these cells uh, uh, and uh, also within a comparative context of other uh, what one can call microconnectomes. And then uh, finally we provide annotations of classical references for the first re uh, demonstrations of these properties uh, in order to establish the, um, the, their defining characteristics. Okay, at this point we might say, well, um, we're interested now, we see that there is evidence for these different kinds of uh, receptors and currents. We see some of the classical references to it. Uh, what kind of models have been built based on these uh, experimental properties? And we can go immediately then to model DB. Uh, and here for the mitral cell uh, is a list of the different kinds of compartmental models of a mitral cell. And I just show for, uh, as an example, uh, a model that we did a number of years ago uh, with Michael Hines in the, uh, of the mitral cell. And this indicates how one can go to the actual files for running that model. Uh, this is for the transient sodium. And uh, the key the, fir the first key is that you can run the model immediately. You don't have to build this model from a, uh, the publication, as one used to have to do. One can actually take the model as it was run for a paper and immediately run it yourself. So it comes, I think, as close as we can get to the, c the way that every publication needs to provide th uh, the specific information about the agents for obtaining those results so that they can be repeated. And that's a key for computational neuroscience, is that we've got to be able to repeat those experiments uh, by other labs uh, in order to uh, build on the finding. And the key here, and the next key, is that each of these properties can be swiped and changed so that this model can become your model um, uh, if you, as, as you uh, 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 begin to run it and have other, uh, have other kinds of data that would provide you with a way of, of running it uh, in, a, in a new way. So uh, we can also then go to ModelDB, uh, the home page, 
and explore the inventory of the models in many different ways. So by model name, down now, we can see that under model name we have 734 models now, each of them curated by Tom Morse in the lab. You can also explore them by first author, uh, each author, or by uh, region. Here is by cell type. And so you can go in and find a, a model in your particular region that you uh, would be interested in. Uh, here are by transmitters. Uh, and uh, these are the different kinds of uh, cells that are GABAergic or, or uh, glutamatergic or whatever. Uh, we also have uh, different simulators. So although uh, we have our own interest in the simulator neuron because Michael Hines is uh, one of the group and has maintained neuron for uh, well over 20, 25 years, um, we have a number of other simulators that are represented. You can see here there are over 70 different simulators. Uh, MATLAB is well represented. Um, uh, Genesis is well represented, and, uh, so, and so forth. So um, that, that illustrate, ind indicates that whatever uh, simulator you, uh, you use, uh, will uh, will probably be represented in uh, one or another of these uh, these models. Uh, we can also search by uh, author. So one of the classic models is UPI's of the uh, uh, olfactory uh, mitral cell, as well as others here. So there are four uh, by him, and you can go in and. Uh, examine those as, uh, as well. So this uh, illustrates then the, uh, the aim of, getting, of using models to integrate the information in the, uh, as represented in CellProp and in NeuronDB into these quantitative models for, um, for uh, each, each cell type. And then finally, we go to microcircuit da database, and here we have started to build up the models specifically representing microcircuits. And here we have something like 180 or so of these kinds of uh, th these kinds of models uh, that are, um, represent both realistic microcircuits, the kind that are built on realistic representations of the neurons, as I've shown you in NeuronDB and also connectionist networks that are of the uh, artificial neural network type. OK, so I think we're in reasonably good time here. So let me now, let me now go. Hold on, uh, I think we want to get out of this and go back to there. So now we are back in our PowerPoint. So now I'd like to show you several uh, ways, that, uh, se several of the kinds of results that have been produced by uh, this uh, using the information that's in Sense Lab. One is a uh, paper that uh, Michele Migliori and I did uh, a number of years ago um, in which he uh, made a preliminary effort to relate the expression of different Ion, ionic channels uh, uh, relate them to the different morphologies of different kinds, uh, uh, different kinds of dendritic morphologies. And so starting out with synaptic inputs, activating um, cells with large or small temporal windows, um, he was able to work his way through uh, a, um, a decision tree uh, that uh, uh, enabled uh, him to identify the uh, se sequence of decision points that produce, uh, in the expression of properties that produce uh, the properties of the different kinds of cells, uh, 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 including mitral cells, neocortical and CA1 cells, and uh, thal thalamocortical and Purkinje, et cetera, on this side. 
So again, that's a new way of classifying cells uh, in relation to integrative properties that, is, that cuts across the different kinds of morphological types that we tend to be uh, very, very much uh, fixated on. Uh, and at the microcircuit level, we, um, with uh, McKelly and with Tom McTavish and Michael Hines, have been developing a scaled up model, realistic model, of the mitral cell, granule cell interactions. And this represents the uh, current stage we're at, in which we have 500 mitral cells um, receiving input uh, from glomerular activity patterns as determined by Kensaku Mori's uh, experiments using intrinsic imaging, uh, interacting with 10,000 granule cells. And this is a site, uh, as shown by Mori's uh, uh, maps, uh, uh, where there is a relatively weak input to a set of mitral cells. And this shows over time the emergence of that excitatory activity with the emergence of inhibition, uh, lateral inhibition on either side, due to the activation of granule cells uh, starting at this, uh, at this point in the learning process. Uh, this is a much stronger input, giving you much stronger lateral inhibition, and uh, so forth. And the key here is to show how extensive lateral inhibition is uh, within this uh, region of the of the uh, olfactory bulb, much much more extensive than uh, pre had been previously thought, but as is going to be needed in order to explain the distance independent nature of the processing that takes place uh, within the olfactory bulb. Uh, there's a lot of of interest now in systems biology, and in systems uh, in 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 terms of different systems in the, in the nervous system. Uh, what we have in the olfactory bulb is a need to recognize that those systems are controlled by the, the respiration of the animal in delivering the sensory stimulus to the sensory receptors. And here, we're, uh, this is a, a recent experiment published uh, by Matt Phillips uh, uh, in which the lateral inhibition of the mitral cells differs depending on the phase of respiration, whether it's inspiration or expiration. And you can see that lateral inhibition is sensitive to the phase of the, of the respiration. And so that means that our system's biology has to take account not only of the neural systems, but also of the body systems that are uh, providing the input. And so uh, that, I remind you that all of this is aimed then at this sequence of operations that's taking place uh, within the microcircuits uh, of, uh, of this system from the olfactory bulb, olfactory cortex, orbital frontal cortex. Um, and so here I think I'm going to go back to the, to the high wire because I'd like to now end by indicating the context for Sense Lab, in relation to uh, some of the other major efforts that are taking place in order to develop neuroinformatics tools and to move toward this integration. And the main theme here is that INCF and neuroinformatics has, it, it now focuses very largely on tools, or, or predominantly on tools, because um, it's been such a struggle from the start with the Human Brain Project to develop the tools in order to work toward this goal of, uh, of a brain integration. And in fact, it was a problem with the Human Brain Project um, during the early years of funding, because people said, well, where's, where's the result? Um, and in fact, it was uh, uh, much of the effort was put in by the brain imagers, for example, just warping the brain and being able to compare uh, the results in different labs. And I remember when Mike Gazaniga 
uh, as editor of the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, um, suggested a policy in which all papers submitted to the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience should provide the data sets for the generation of those uh, results, there was a tremendous outroar from the uh, field because they were reluctant to do that. And it was only after a couple of years when uh, a review committee gave um, a strong support for this idea that there was a general recognition that this is the way you share data in that particular field. Um, you share your data sets so that people can see how the data was generated and can uh, do their own comparisons. Uh, and so uh, I think there have been so many issues about building uh, databases and building the tools that we've lost sight, a, a little bit lost sight, of what the real goal is, and that is the integration. And so I'd like to give uh, an indication of how we might move toward that, in, uh, that integration uh, in terms of the tools we'll need to do it and the in integrative uh, uh, approaches. So let me start out here. So one of the things we need to, we need to have a general uh, 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 recognition of what the resources are that go beyond the particular ones that we're building. And one of the ones that I think is important to know about is the IUFAR nomenclature. Uh, how many people know about IUFAR? Okay, a few people. So here's, here's for the rest of us. Um, I, I would probably be among the uh, ones who wouldn't be so aware, except that I was put on the committee <coughs> to, uh, to represent uh, olfactory receptors. It turned out that the number of uh, olfactory receptors is greater than the number of all the other GPRs, CRs put together. And they have developed a nomenclature for all the others, but it, uh, we found that it was just not possible to apply it to the olfactory receptor. So it's an illustration of uh, some of the problems in developing general uh, nomenclature that apply uh, to all parts of a system. So here, for example, are G-protein coupled receptors, and here, for example, are the 5-hydroxytryptamine receptors, and if you go into any one of these, you see you bring up a tremendous amount of data here. Tremendous amount of data about agonists, antagonists, transduction mechanisms, tissue distribution, and so forth. So this is definitely a um, resource that we ought to know about. Uh, the, same, the same is available with regard to ion channels. So here are sodium channels, for example. Uh, here are well, one kind of sodium channel, and again, you go down here and you can see uh, the, uh, <coughs> the uh, very rich amount of information there is, annotation and all the rest, about uh, any given channel type. So um, again, I think if, we, if this level is going to be uh, a, uh, a, a, an, an essential part of building up the, um, the multi-scale uh, uh, integrated view of the brain that we're all after, then we need to have, uh, be aware of the resources uh, that are going to be adequate to that. So the next I'd like to show is the NIF. So now if you key the NIF in, you'll get the National Ignition Facility, and there's no way we can get rid of it. <laughs> We're working hard. We're her working hard to displace it. Um, but, uh, and uh, now that we're in, uh, now that we're in Germany, we can't even get up to uh, uh, as high as we really ought to be. But um, nope, that's that was the wrong one. <laughs> so how about this one here? Here we go. <clears throat> so here, 
So here we are with the uh, NIF. And I assume uh, most, most of you have heard about the Neuroscience Information Framework led by Marianne Martone. I don't know if she, she's uh, here yet. Um, but uh, the, um, uh, this is a portal uh, with a tremendous amount of uh, functionality built into it. And you'll hear more about it uh, in later, uh, in later uh, uh, talks. But um, I thought I, what I would show you is uh, something that we're involved in, and that is if you go down here to Neurolex, and, and go to neurons in the hierarchies, then you get a list of neurons, uh, subcategories of neurons, as neuron types, uh, that uh, is now up to over 200, to around 250. So this is a much more comprehensive, this is a truly comprehensive attempt to characterize the main types of neurons throughout the nervous system. It will include both vertebrate and uh, invertebrate. And so uh, uh, the, uh, one of the examples I wanted to show of how this works is in the amygdala here. So here is uh, how each of these entries we're aiming to provide for basic information and then a minimum of specific properties, soma, dendrite, axon specific properties, and intrinsic properties. And so you see this is similar to cell prop, but uh, it attempts to identify properties that become the defining properties of a given cell type. Uh, and at the same time, to enable us to go in and, for example, with GABA, to identify all of the cells that use GABA. This is one way of representing it. But there's an even better way, and that's to go back and so you you could ask what are what are all of the cells that share a, a given uh, neurotransmitter uh, as a, uh, a uh, as the transmitter released and here quite quite quickly you can go and get an entire inventory of all those 250 cells uh, for which ones are cholinergic which ones are GABAergic, which ones are glutamatergic, et cetera. And so we want to do that now for all the other properties that are listed there. So give me all the spiny neurons, give me all the pyramidal neurons, uh, et cetera. And uh, <clears throat> working with uh, Stephen Larson, we have a small grant from, the, um, from, the, uh, uh, from INCF uh, to uh, uh, engage domain experts in helping us to identify these main cell types and their properties in different areas. I just show you the curator page here, uh, <clears throat> and you can see that we already have some 20 people uh, who've signed on to provide this information, and we encourage anyone who uh, would like to volunteer for their own favorite neuron to, uh, to let us know. So the next I'd like to show is the Allen Brain Atlas. And I don't think I need to um, belabor this because uh, there'll be, I'm sure, uh, much discussion about uh, the re uh, resources available in the Allen Brain Atlas. But one of the things we want to do with Neuron, with Neurolex, Neuron, and with Cellprop is to link to the, the uh, different patterns, uh, laminar and otherwise, of staining and localization of properties uh, uh, so that one can go from those properties to the, the individual cell types in a particular region or layer or vice versa. Uh, another, another project that ought to, needs to be part of this uh, overview is the Blue Brain Project that Sean Hill is involved with Henry Markram in uh, uh, running in Lausanne. 
And uh, <clears throat> I think this is also well known as an attempt to provide a comprehensive description of the, cor the, uh, the uh, cerebral cortex in terms of these different layers, uh, levels of organization that uh, Sean uh, ha was illustrating. Uh, the uh, Blue Brain Project is now a, a core site for the proposal for a blue brain for a human brain project. So now, um, after the blue after the human brain project ended in uh, 2000 around 2005 in the U.S., uh, INCF came in, and now the the uh, uh, blue brain project uh, came in, and now the human brain project. And so that has its own website as well. And I thought I should just indicate, uh, I think s some of you may have heard that this is a, a, a large, very large program that they're uh, competing for. This is not a program in biology or in neuroscience. Uh, the Human Brain Project, Sean can uh, explain further, uh, is applying with it for funds within a very high technology, cutting edge technology uh, grant program. It's the, I think, the only one uh, represented in neuroscience because they propose to use cutting edge uh, um, computational and other, other um, um, methodologies. Uh, but the, uh, the research areas here are very impressive in bringing together these different um, uh, ar areas of research uh, that um, I can't, can't, I can't get down. Here we go. So you can see that the, the whole range of issues is going, is going to be included in this trans-European uh, uh, project. This again represents uh, uh, this original goal of the Human Brain Project uh, of doing the actual integration. And it shows how comprehensive this kind of integration is going to need to be, not only for the, the scientific aspects of brain organization, but all these other aspects of it, the med medical, the supercomputing aspects, the educational aspects and the ethical, legal, and social sciences aspects. Uh, finally, we don't want to forget <coughs> the Connectome Project. And <coughs> how many here are part of the Connectome Project? Not so many. Um, but this is a, a tremendous project in the U, mainly focused in the U.S. Um, for carrying out a comprehensive analysis of the human con connectome. And so I, I don't know whether we need this big a program, tens of billions of dollars, to do the, uh, the, to do the macro connectome, but we um, certainly, I think, want to think in terms of a micro-connectome project um, that would connect with the macro-connectome project. Because after all, why do we have a macro-connectome? It's to connect the parts of the brain that are actually doing the computation. So let me end by going back to So let me let me uh, go ahead here. I think we were here, right? Okay. The future. So what I what I would uh, propose is that we need to work toward uh, principles of comparative neural systems. So we each work on our own neural system, but I think comparing systems across other parts of the brain, comparing systems across other species uh, that have <coughs> the system we're working on, uh, and comparing across uh, vertebrate and invertebrate as well. Here's an example of what I would call the comparative approach. <coughs> I did this study several years ago. Um, 
in the olfactory system, in the olfactory cortex, we've identified a basic circuit in which the input comes into the apical dendrites and the apical dendrites the, 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 uh, of the pyramidal neurons. The pyramidal neurons then have recurrent excitatory collaterals, recurrent inhibitory uh, uh, circuits feeding back on them with some feed forward as well. We propose that this is a basic circuit and indeed you can apply this in, uh, <coughs> with uh, minor modifications to the hippocampus and to uh, uh, turtle dorsal cortex. Uh, as, um, as Kriegstein and Connors did. Uh, one can then propose that uh, neocortex arose out of a kind of a duplication of that organization so that one has uh, superficial and deep uh, divisions of the neocortex, layers two, three, and uh, five, five, six particularly, in which um, uh, this basic circuit is embedded in each one. Uh, this has been used, for example, uh, recently by Fritjof Helmschen uh, at a uh, Genalia meeting <coughs> we attended in which he showed uh, an, uh, an adaptation of that to show uh, uh, how it might help to uh, account for the results that he had got in identifying different uh, in kinds of inputs coming in here from the VPM here from the posterior medial, here from other areas of cortex, uh, so that uh, this provided a way of thinking in an integrative context about, the, um, about his own uh, analysis of these pathways in the cortex. Here is <coughs> uh, an example of the Kevin Martin, um, uh, Rodney Douglas, uh, and, um, neocortical uh, canonical microcircuit uh, which has uh, two, three, and five, six uh, with recurrent exc excitation, recurrent inhibition in a very similar way. It's essentially the same circuit that I showed you. And so <clears throat> I, th I think you can see that there are indications of a convergence of the integrative approach. Uh, and I think we should uh, continually look for these convergences uh, as ways of uh, beginning to build a, con a consensus representation of the map, and so of the brain map. And so uh, I leave you with the question, the human micro connectome project, is that in the future for us, um, in which the micro, macro connectome uh, connects the, uh, the micro connectome, and that maybe this is a, uh, a, 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 a goal uh, that uh, the NIF can uh, provide a driving force for, as well as uh, the INCF. And finally, uh, this is the Sense Lab team. Uh, Perry Miller has been uh, the backbone of our uh, informatics. Uh, Michael Hines has been uh, the backbone of our computation. And all these other uh, colleagues have been uh, just a wonderful group to work with. Thank you very much. Coffee? <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. Questions. I, I have a question for you uh, from the part of your talk when you were discussing uh, in, in the part of your talk where you were discussing uh, the computational models in, in your, your databases and, and keeping track of uh, the models in a way that they could just be in, sort of installed and run. Right. Right. And I wonder if you could say a few words on uh, challenges in doing that, in sort of making sure that you're keeping up with the literature on that. So this is a very good question. So if you make models easily available for running, I think what you're saying is if anybody can run the models, maybe they don't have the background uh, in understanding the, the nuances of of the data, this is one of the problems with electrophysiology particularly, that you really need to have a thorough understanding of the properties uh, in order to begin to uh, build your own representation of a, uh, of a particular model. Is that, is that what you're getting? No, no. 
Uh, <laughs> That's a great answer, but it's not my question. Ah, so, all right, good. My, my question is, so you've got to really, if, if you're doing that, which I think is extremely valuable, um, you, you've got to kind of keep up, some, find a way to keep up with all the new models that are being published in the literature, and isn't that challenging? Well, that's, that's sort of what I was getting at. Oh, okay. If you don't, if, if you're not familiar with the field, then are you running your model in, in, in a field in which you have no, you have no particular background, is that what you're saying? And so, and you as a curator, you as curating the database, how do you keep the database current with the new, the, all the new models are published? Or maybe I'm overestimating yeah. the no, volume. The, the, data, the database is accumulative. So all, it, it, it starts, it goes back to classical models like Maynard and Sanowski in 1995, um, and it's there. Uh, they're all there. And uh, you can uh, 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 run them or you can update them as, as you wish. And you can also search, you could also uh, determine when you search them which are the latest ones and which are, which are, the, which are the classic ones. Yeah. Could you just turn it off? Okay. Hi, thank you so much for that talk, actually. I've got pages and pages of notes trying to relate what you've been doing to, to the areas that I work in. But I was thinking about, particularly about your, your databases where you have, you know, neurons and here's their properties and here's their receptors, and these seem to all be facts. Does anybody ever come to you and say, no, I want to argue with you about that point? Or do you have a representation of probabilities, like most of the time this is true, or all the time this is true, or we've never found a counterexample, or any sort of evidence like that? So one of those, one of those entries was pink, and that means that that's... Uh, been shown not to be present, uh, that property. And so that's one of the things we want to know. However, there's a recent uh, paper that we were looking at recently that uh, in which they've looked at NAV1, 1.1, 2, and 6, and those subtypes uh, are all present to different degrees and different uh, 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 subtypes of, of hippocampal pyramidal neurons. And so Rapidly, a database can get very complicated. Uh, and, but that's exactly, in my opinion, why you have a database. So that you can annotate those complications or provide uh, models with those uh, complications and let people then figure out themselves how they want to let the classification evolve. It's a tremendous challenge for a classification and we don't want to get weighted down by thousands and thousands of different subtypes of neurons or subtypes of channels. On the other hand, we want to represent what is of active interest to most people doing research in a particular field, what's most useful to them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really impressed by so many databases. Uh, perhaps we'll hear about this later in the conference, but are there some uh, people who build uh, machines, uh, database crawlers, using artificial intelligence to um, implement uh, questions, questions that you might have in mind that uh, would avoid So you mean in silicon? You mean actual no, I, devices? No, I would assume it would be a software, a machine that would crawl through the database and, and use some methods of artificial intelligence oh, okay. to, to provide some sort of understanding. Yeah. Um, I don't know how, I'm just curious how well that it is already advanced and what, what's, what's happening. There are now. others here uh, who uh, can answer that question uh, with far more intel uh, knowledge than I can, maybe, maybe Mark maybe or, maybe or this is uh, Jeff. Jeff, Jeff here. Or maybe that can be a discussion point for later. Uh, Marianne, do you want to answer that? Here, got a microphone here. We always, we always uh, uh, depend on Marianne to oh. So uh, in of terms of employing it formally within, for example, NIF, um, the answer is it has not yet been done. There are things like Wolfram Alpha and others that are trying to do this for larger data sets. But you know, again, the idea of a NIF would be that there are different steps involved. And now that we have all of this information being sort of unified in a platform, being able to build an agent that would be able to go in and query it in an AI-like fashion. We do have ontologies and other things that 
that drive NIF. So there are some concept-based searches and those sorts of things. But I don't think there's been yet any sort of data-driven application that goes in and tries to make sense of this massive information. Um, there are some posters on workflows and various types of analytics that we've done. But I think it's sort of ripe for somebody to do just that. It's like now that we have all of this data, what do we do with it? <laughs> Who's going to write the algorithms? <laughs> no, I, so I think there is a, um, an, um, uh, an implicit problem of who's going to put it all together. And I, I think we can only uh, do that by a community effort. And that's why I think the IUFAR nomenclature is, is a good example of how communities come together. Each of those Ion Channel communities made their decisions, and then IUFAR put it all together. And so I think that's how, how we're going to need, uh, how we are proceeding, that's how we'll, we'll need to proceed. Yeah. Okay, I'm wondering if you think that there might be a limit as to how far we can go in this endeavor due to our inability to get sufficient detail about, um, about properties. For example, maybe it's necessary exactly what's going on at each synapse in order to um, construct a, the actual circuit that is performing some function. We must be very careful not to drown in detail. Detail, I mean, the devil is always in the details. However, um, what's important, I think, is to be able to work at a more conceptual level at each level so that you can provide input to the next level. And that's, for example, uh, the idea of our canonical representation of the neuron. That's the idea of Martin and Douglas with their canonical representation of circuits, is that it gives you a, essentially a working hypothesis for what is essential about that particular level so that uh, you can then uh, use it to, uh, to uh, drive the next experiments. I think we'll, we'll take one or two more questions. There's one here and then this one. Uh, so I have a slightly basic question which goes to ask, uh, and maybe this borrows from ideas of systems biology, that we seem to have a lot of uh, like structural models and structural databases of the various neuron types and the kind of like receptors present on these neurons. But what about behavioral models and, you know, trying to go from structure to behavior to function. Uh, are there, you know, has there been a curation of these behavioral models? May that be in silico or in vivo and trying to correlate from structure to function? Why, of course, behavior and, you know, higher level, uh, higher systems levels? Yeah, that's an that's a, uh, excellent question. Uh, a very uh, disturbing one in a way because, as you say, we have been focusing on structures that we can all agree on are there, are entities. Um, but uh, it, the, uh, even characterizing the functional properties of neurons and systems uh, is something that, a step that we are not yet able to take because uh, function is so nuanced in, in the, the uh, analysis of neurons and systems that we haven't yet developed a, an, an efficient way to represent that. And the same goes with behavior, because behavior can be represented by bar graphs, by videos, by in so many different ways that I agree that that is a really big challenge for the future. So, we've got a microphone. There. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I'm always struck by the huge amount of data we collect, and yet one of the goals of science is abstraction. We all recognize, for instance, that F equals MA is wrong, but an incredibly useful abstraction. One of the things I worry about, about getting caught up in this neuroinformatics approach, is forgetting that one large role is to get some abstraction that you can carry around and simplify your understanding of a system rather than complicate it 
with all the details. If I have to carry around all of the details to understand the system, then am I any better off than I was when I had the system in the first place? And so I think that comes back to the, one of the main themes that I, I was uh, in, encouraging us to think about, and that is now that we've developed uh, many of the tools we need for uh, archiving the details <coughs> that we need now to do the integration. And the integration has to focus on the essential details um, that then give rise to the concepts that uh, move us forward in a, in a conceptual way. I agree, I agree absolutely. All right, one oh, very yeah. last question. Uh, Mary, Mary. And it's a comment. <laughs> so uh, um, at these meetings, we often get questions like, when are we going to abstract? Um, I, I think this kind of work is always dialectical in the sense that we need to go to the details.